Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Disruptive Technologists. Uh, I am your, uh, I, know, I guess I'm an MC. I'm a, I'm a, do I have a special title? I need a better title. Whatever it is, I'm, I'm the awesome, good looking guy up front. Master of Ceremonies? That's good enough. Okay, so um, my job right now is to kick this off, get you guys all excited. First, what I want to do is make sure that all the wonderful sponsors, the people who have made this event possible, are thanked because they're the ones that have brought you all here. Um, and so, oh my God, party foul, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, the hint water um, <laughs> comes with a uh, you know warning, um, but we'll talk about that. So uh, just so you know, uh, my name is David Franklin. Uh, I have been with Disruptive Technologists uh, for some time now. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to, to help uh, you know, bring this crowd together and, and you know, share the knowledge, the education, you know, the wonderful panelists that we have. Uh, I'm actually an IT guy by trade. Um, I'm in the real estate space. I work for Yardy Systems. Uh, I also have an IT consulting firm called Availer on Consulting. So if anybody wants IT work, let me know. Uh, but with that, uh, I want to start by uh, introducing Microsoft. So is Mary Baker? No. no, she's not even here. So she's like, all right. So I am going to be Mary Baker for the next 30 seconds. So Microsoft is the company that is giving us this space. So uh, you may have heard of Microsoft. Uh, they started a couple of years ago. They're, they're kind of in a growth phase. Um, <laughs> but what's really exciting with Microsoft is that they actually have a plan um, that is tuned for new businesses. So a lot of the things that we talk about are startups, right? Uh, so if you're a new company and you need to get all your technology in order, Microsoft has a plan called BizSpark. And BizSpark is where they will give you all of their stuff for free. And for like three years, you can use it until either you make like a million dollars, at which point you've got a very high class problem, uh, or you know, I think just the time runs out. So, but you get to keep everything that you've used in that time. So it's really great for companies starting out um, I do want to pitch that. We've used that in the past. Um, very, very good. So since Mary's not here to take credit, I'm taking credit for BizSpark. Yes, question. Hmm? Why do they get you retired? They get you to be lifelong fans of Microsoft. Right? It's like a crack dealer. The first taste is free. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's really how it works. Okay, so... Yeah, she would not have said that. Um, you know, if anybody's quoting this, you know, and it says Mary Baker, right? Um, Hashtag, I didn't say that. Um, okay. <laughs> Our founding sponsor for tonight uh, is a company, it's McCarter and English. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit about them. Uh, their attorneys uh, at McCarter and English is uh, Venture Capital and Emerging Growth Companies Group. That's a mouthful. Uh, they guide growth companies through the challenges of building successful businesses. All right? Their clients uh, span a broad spectrum of technologies, including web and mobile, life sciences, software, energy, clean technology, and healthcare services. So their attorneys are well versed on the issues associated with protecting intellectual property, identifying finance financing sources, allocating equity amongst, invest, uh, amongst founders, oh, that's a hard one, uh, <laughs> investors and others, establishing equity compensation and incentive arrangements. Where were they when I was building my company? Jesus. Uh, recruiting board members. Uh, maybe some of these people want to be board members of your companies, and that could be exciting. And otherwise, putting a foundation in place for client companies' uh, future growth. So uh, McCarter and English. I think there's some pa um, pamphlets out front, too, if anybody you know, needs that type of consulting. Um, this is the place to get it. Uh, next, we've got uh, Vizio Tag. These are the brilliant geniuses who are uh, filming our uh, event, right? Uh, they've actually got uh, their nice screen up there. Uh, what they do is too complicated for me to explain in the 10 seconds that I have to explain it, but I want you to go find Steve, find and Jeff, Jeff and talk right? right? And, and, oh, Jeff's, oh, Jeff already, oh, he's going to explain it, so I'm off the hook. Jeff, come, explain, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jeff Paul. I work with the uh, Visiotag uh, team. Uh, our founder is here behind the camera. Steve, uh, thank you for putting this together. Uh, we're going to give you in two minutes the VizioTag story. Um, so what we believe is we believe in the future, which is the future is now, is that viewers want a more efficient, better way to search, find, share, and consume video. Right now, the explosion of video has been tremendous, but the tools to help manage that video and put it to work and make it uh, happen for you uh, have fallen far behind, and that's the, the 
particular problem that we solve. Uh, so in the future, uh, which we know it includes Visiotag, which is a host-based offering, uh, viewers are going to be able to watch the content that's relevant for them. For instance, this particular conference is a couple of hours long. Uh, we have taped, we are the tape sponsor, the video sponsor, and we're very grateful for being invited to do that. It's a two-hour video. You really can't sit there and watch the whole thing because you're going to miss it or uh, you know, something's going to happen and you're not, not going to be able to do it. When it's Visio tagged, you get a visual table of contents so that you can go right to the part of it that you want to get to, and then you can share it or you can go back to it or you can skip over it. Uh, whatever happens. Matter of fact, this particular event, it is rich with a ton of content with subject matter expertise that are wildly brilliant and you may not catch it all the first time through. The good news is tomorrow, the next day, it'll be available on the Visiotag platform with the table of contents and you'll say, wait, I want to go back and see exactly what that brilliant man said. You'll be able to do that. Um, we have our team here. We have our demo booth outside. If you'd like to come talk to us during the breaks, we would love to uh, uh, talk to you about your particular issues of what you have. This is a, just a sample little screen, and let me just step over here. If you can see, the video is running here. This is the uh, Disruptive Technology event from June. There's a woman from Microsoft giving her talk. Here's a table of contents. You can click on a part that you want to go to. Oh, thank you. Um, there's a table of contents. It's got rich metadata. So the more metadata you put in, the better it is. We expose that metadata to internal and external search engines. So now you can find not only the video where that topic is, you can find the moment in time in that video and go right there. And you can go back to it, or you can go over it, or you can send it to your friend and say, oh my god, you got to hear what this guy just said. Okay, <clears throat> and all of this is host-based. You can do it as an authoring tool, or if you'd like, we have professionals, we'll do it for you, however you like it. How am I doing on time? Uh, you're out of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so what's a little bit different about us is we do concept-based deep tagging. Come to the back and talk to us, we'll tell you what that means. Um, we're a full production shop, we're YouTube experts. So we can set up your YouTube channels for you. We can optimize them for you. We can do search engine optimization so that your YouTube videos will show up on the first page of a Google search. And uh, we have some of our clients uh, have a lot of work in the arts uh, group here in New York. Um, you know, part of, edu uh, part of their di distance education um, things. We have some very good market pundits. Uh, Paul Denae, who's a world-renowned marketing uh, genius. And Andrea Nuremberger, who does a tremendous amount of corporate training, uh, some of our clients. So our recording team is here tonight. Uh, we're available um, here to do a demo. This event will be available on the Visiotag uh, platform in a day or two. And we're looking for a select few early adopters here who would like to uh, see our stuff. They're Thank you very much. They're in the back. In the in the back. back. Come Thank find you. them. Thank you. OK, see, I told you there's no way I could do that in 10 seconds. Um, all right, so with that, um, moving right along, uh, I do want to mention um, Funding Post, because you are all eating delicious sandwiches, right? There's some gourmet sandwiches out there. They came from Funding Post. Um, I'm sure many of the people in this audience know Funding Post, but just for the few who might not, for 17 years, Funding Post has worked to bring entrepreneurs together with leading investors worldwide. Uh, they believe that it's important to reach investors in every medium possible, both online and offline. So here we are meeting offline. So hopefully there's some investors. Hopefully there's some people looking for investment. Uh, then we also have Hint Water, uh, the Essence Water, this delicious flavored beverage. Um, and actually, we have a representative from Hint Water right in the back. That's Tony Fiorello. So uh, if you enjoy this kind of water, and, and by the way, who is Hint perfect for? There's three types of people that Hint is perfect for. There's those who don't like the taste of plain water but value their health. There are those who are trying to give up soda or diet soda, and those who don't drink diet soda or soda but want a treat. So if you're any of those people, talk to Tony. Uh, I also want to mention Dana Stevens. As always, she is uh, she's our own special lady. She's the one who has brought you the wine. So if any of you are, are drinking some delicious wine, you can thank Dana. I don't know where she's sitting, but she's somewhere. Uh, and I do also want to give a special shout out uh, to Willie Hopkins and his students. So we have Willie Hopkins from uh, City College. Okay. Brooklyn. Okay. And, and students who are here tonight. So thank you guys for joining. Uh, we're, we're really, really ha glad to have you. You are like the next generation. Right, so I'm the old guy. I'm I'm leaving. You come on in, take my place. 
Um, with that, now we can do a quick giveaway. So we have, uh, we were collecting business cards, people's names. So I am now going to reach into this magic bin with my eyes closed and my hands not feeling the texture or business cardiness of what this may be. And I'm gonna randomly pick something. And we have Stano, in between silence where we really exist. Who is Stano? Hey, there's Stano. All right, he gets a 3D rudder VR interactive controller. Uh, so basically it's a thing, you sit and like you move your feet and, and as you tilt, it moves you around in, in VR space. So it was, uh, you know, yeah, it, it's pretty cool. So they're coming around. We're actually gonna bring it right to you. So just stay where you are. Uh, let me do two more quickly. Okay, eyes closed. I don't know what this is. Oh, it's a piece of paper, but I don't know what's written on it. <sighs> you have to write in like legible handwriting. S H O H R Q T. Shorot Hashimov at gmail.com. Ah, there's somebody back there. Sorry for butchering your name so absolutely abysmally. But you get a VR controller. I wish I could say that to everybody, but I'm not Oprah. Okay, one more, one more. Very quickly. Here we go. VR slash AR Association. Dexter Yee. Hey, he sounds like the kind of guy who needs a VR controller. Very good. Okay, uh, and then quickly we'll do three t-shirts just because we've got them and we want you to have them. Uh, okay, Xiaofeng Sung. I think I kind of got that. Ah, there we go. You get a t-shirt. And Aaron Clement. Yeah, Aaron Clement. Ah, Aaron. There you go. Okay, very nice. She gets a t-shirt. And last person but not least is uh, Rita Sony. Rita, Rita! Oh, look at this. Very good. Okay, you get a t-shirt. So, thank you all for participating. We're going to keep all your contact information, and we're going to do wonderful things with it, I'm sure. Uh, with that, now, let me introduce our moderator, uh, Ed McGuire. So, Ed McGuire is uh, Insights Partner at Momenta Partners, and he is going to take it from here. Ed? Fantastic. Thank you, David. So welcome everybody to a uh, another edition of Disruptive Technologists. I'm uh, I'm I'm kind of new stepping into this role, and I and I'm grateful to uh, Lauren and David for giving me a shot. I'll give you a little bit of a background so that you uh, have a little sense of where I'm coming from, and, and then I'll introduce the panel, and then we'll get to the real uh, the the meat of the evening. So, uh, as I mentioned, my name's Ed McGuire. I am currently an insights partner at Momenta Partners, which is a, a firm that's focused on connected sure. industry. Well, I'll, I'll turn that on in just a second. Uh, <laughs> should, I, should I turn it on or should I? Go ahead. Should I speak into the mic? Either way. Yeah, either way. Um, so Momenta is focused on uh, industrial IoT or connected industry, and what we do is, is uh, we do uh, advisory uh, to large companies and small companies. Uh, we have an executive search business uh, where we currently have, uh, well, we've done over 150 executive placements, and we also have a VC fund, uh, which is focused on transportation, uh, energy, uh, manufacturing, and connected spaces, which is essentially smart cities. So we do uh, C to A round. We're going to be raising our connected industry fund to targeting $50 million raise uh, this first half of this year. Uh, my role is as an insights partner is uh, uh, really is, is, is an extension of what I did for the last 17 years. So I was a Wall Street analyst. I worked on, at Merrill Lynch, uh, at CIBC World Markets before that, and CLSA for the last seven years. I was an enterprise software analyst, so I f but I also focused quite a bit on uh, in innovation and disruptive technologies. So uh, one of my passion, really what has, you know, what's, what's motivated me over the last decade, uh, inspired initially by a lot of Ray Kurzweil's work, because if anybody is familiar with Ray Kurzweil's work in music. He made some amazing synthesizers. But when I first saw his his book, you know, the singularity is near. And, and uh, after reading the Age of Spiritual Machines in. Um, 2000, he's a real visionary, and that kind of inspired me to go deep and kind of understand how you how there were these very long-term 
trends that would affect our lives. These exp this concept of exponential change where things start, start off very slowly, but all of a sudden you see this, this change happening very quickly. Uh, I did a lot of work around uh, you know, in artificial intelligence and, and robotics, self-driving cars, uh, clean energy, and uh, in particular, uh, industrial IoT. I'm doing a lot of work in blockchain right now, which I think is extraordinarily exciting. And uh, so I was, I was so thrilled when Lauren asked if I'd be willing to moderate. So um, I, let me introduce our panel, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to, we're as uh, I guess is the tradition here, it's pretty freewheeling, so you know, don't, don't, feel, uh, don't feel shy about uh, peppering us with questions. Um, we, uh, to starting from, uh, I guess, from left to right, um, uh, we've got uh, Bruce Weed, uh, Nick Adams, uh, Aaron Price, uh, Mark Clifton, and wait, who is it? John Egger. Okay, we, we were at the end. All right, I'm going to I'm going to make it really easy and ask them to 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 introduce themselves. So, with that, let's uh, Bruce. Could why don't you start off and, and provide a, just a bit of an overview of what uh, your your background and, and your interest in disruptive technologies? Sure. Um, so my background is in computer science, and I work for IBM currently. I focus on the bleeding edge technology, so AI, uh, IoT, blockchain in particular, all in a cloud environment, obviously. And I really, my main role is to help corporations and startups worldwide adopt this technology. So I go out and do a lot of evangelism. I do a lot of whiteboarding, explaining to clients how this technology works, engaging with them to figure out what's the right solution and also so they don't kind of overestimate right sometimes clients come in and think oh blockchain's the you know the answer to everything and and it isn't right it's good for certain things and not for others so it's really kind of helping the clients work through that process and uh, i run two different uh LinkedIn groups, one around AI and IoT, and one around blockchain. So if you're interested in those, you can go uh, take a look in, on LinkedIn uh, on those. I'm Nick Adams. I, uh, I'm with Differential Ventures here in New York. We're a seed in uh, early stage venture capital fund, uh, split of Flatiron Investors in 2017. Uh, I was with Flatiron for a couple of years, and I'm still a venture partner over there, supporting some of our uh, previous investments. Um, before that, I come from a tech background. I was with a few different startups that um, fortunately did pretty well. Was with Opower before their IPO uh, a few years back, and I was with a company called Rage Frameworks, where I launched a what we now call an AI platform, um, but it was kind of before we called everything AI. Um, it was a semantic intelligence engine um, that interpreted unstructured data and, and structured data too for uh, risk. So happy to be here. Um, uh, again, we're, we're pretty early stage uh, and our focus on the investment side is pretty much anything on the data life cycle. Sort of because I'm sick of saying AI and machine learning, but AI, machine learning, Internet of Things, and all the way to the back end of um, you know, document security. And then we have a fintech arm and an uh, international division as well. Cool. Hello, my name is Aaron Price, and uh, I'm the founder of the New Jersey Tech Meetup and Propelify and our Propelify Innovation Festival. Has anyone attended the New Jersey Tech Meetup or Propelify and the Innovation Festival? Like three of you, some of you? Cool. None of you, apparently. Awesome. <laughs> that went great. So I've been an entrepreneur for the last 20 years. I started my first company actually 20 years ago when I was in college, and I've had some reasonable wins and some mostly plateaus or things that some people call failures that I don't quite call that way. But uh, in starting the New Jersey Tech Meetup and seeing its growth, we launched a, another company called Propelify, where we bring together the innovation community of the Northeast right across the river in Hoboken. Uh, last year we had 10,000 attendees and we do quite a bit around this space. So we have two stages and drones and a startup competition with a big focus around AI and IoT. Um, Ariana Huffington was a speaker, Gary Vee, who maybe some of you guys know, and we're bringing it back uh, next May again. So hopefully I'll see some of you there. As someone who does lots of events, I know what an enormous pain in the ass it is to bring this kind of thing together. And I think they missed a really important part. One is a big round of applause for the guys who put this together tonight. <laughs> what you guys just exhibited is what at our events we call sort of like a lame round of applause. So for round yeah. two, because the sponsors are the ones who actually paid for it. Clifton, I'm the CEO of Princeton Identity. Uh, I was spent out about a year and a half ago from SRI. You might know your SRI from Siri. 
Um, and they're getting recent news is the robotic motorcycle uh, champion uh, for Yamaha. So they do a lot of very interesting things. Uh, my job at SRI was a president of a division that was to, to wander around the labs there and take the technology to market. So try to create products out of the laboratory. One of those products is the iris recognition technology that I took out. Uh, we did the iris recognition for Samsung. Uh, on the Note 7, the Galaxy S8, now the Note 8, and now the S9 coming up. Um, that's our technology in that. Iris, Irish. Irish, not the Irish. Okay. We only recognize the Irish in different ways, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's Iris, your eyes, the color part of your eyes. Um, so, so the applications of, of what we do apply to everything we just talked about to IOT, to FinTech, to healthcare, to anything that identifies you as you, authenticates you as a person. And our vision of the future is basically no keys, no wallet, naked pay, I walk up, I pay for something, looking at something. Um, we do face Irish fingerprint, we do a lot of different things. We're deployed in Dubai airport. Um, we do um, a lot of different uh, technologies, um, and, and it's always getting cheaper and smaller and easier to use. So the key is making it easy and convenient, and, uh, and once it's easy and convenient, people will use it. That's kind of how it goes. Naked pay is going to be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Naked pay. Naked pay. He, he does naked pay, so that's going to be interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm John. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Stay.co. Uh, which is a data management platform for cities. Uh, previously, I was the uh, founding uh, director of community at deviantart.com, uh, and then um, went on to build myplanet.com and was the chief technologist at DigitalOcean. Awesome. So I'm going to dive right in. So the, one of the issues that's emerging right now is that uh, it, with, with all of these connected devices and the fact that we're all you know, carrying around a lot of uh, applications that are associated with our identities, I, I want to talk about identity, digital identity and, and security and, and, and what that means. Um, Mark and I were just having this conversation that, you know, this idea that, um, you, you know, we're, we are no longer, you know, our, our identities are, uh, you know, they're, they're, are, are they, do they belong to us when all of our information is, is part of somebody else's uh, database where they're making a lot of money off us? Or, you know, do we, or is, is there going to be a backlash where people say, listen, you know, I, I, you know my ident the data that I generate, my identity is mine. And you know this is something that, you know we're 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 we're, we're reaching kind of a, a, a terra incognita or like this is this is new space. And I'd love to get from all of you, you know, kind of what what do you think, you know, the 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 issues, the the potential solutions, uh, and maybe some of the challenges that we have coming up, you know, as as we human beings try to navigate a an environment and our digital ide and and assert and and keep control of, of our identities. you mind if I try something? Please. Um, so one day I was sitting with a mayor and he said, could people upload phone bills to your platform? Um, we deal with mostly IoT, so sensors and stuff like that coming in and passing them off to other devices. And I'm like, why the hell did anyone want to upload? Okay, uh, sure, why would anyone up want to upload their phone bill? Uh, and he said, well, I was thinking that maybe we could lower property tax and city taxes by doing what the private companies do with the data, and that is selling it on behalf of the constituents. So if your mayor came to you and said, no property tax, but in return, I want your phone bill, would you upload your phone bill to the city? Hands up. What about your credit card statement? <laughs> what about your health care records? So most people are not in, yeah. And, and I think even a better question is what would you accept from the city in return from that, right? No answers. Just yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, Identities are kind of in our name. So um, we really talk a lot about this at our company, and we really think a lot about it because it's a very serious topic. 
um, and, and realize that the U.S. is different than the rest of the world. You have to understand the difference in culture and the difference in, in just laws and things like that. You go to Europe and you talk to the Europeans about what they're doing with identity, and it's completely different. In Europe, they trust the government and they distrust companies. In the U.S., we distrust the government and we trust companies. Google, Apple, you give them all your information. They record everything you do. So, so that's, that's a given. So, so you have to think about those differences because Europeans are very, very um, close with their identity. There's a lot of privacy laws. They actually have very progressive laws about protecting the identity and, and controlling who collects the information. In the U.S., there's no laws. Oh, there's three states. And the three states have enacted laws about the collection of biometric data only. So Illinois, Texas, and Washington State have, have enacted laws that actually have restrictions and require your consent to collect the biometric data. Biometric data, oh, that's your face. Yep, that's biometric data. Any of you guys football fans? You ever been to any of these states of football stadiums? They have a close-up picture of your face. They, there are 360 photographs of you know, 50, 60,000 people in the stands that they have your face. Did they get your consent to, to do that? Maybe when you, when you accepted the ticket, I don't know. But there's a lot of things going on in this space that once you start to collect biometric data or say that you need require consent, well, why doesn't it require consent when they collect the, the marketing data or they collect my phone bill or the, or the credit card companies are already collecting that data, so that's too late on that. But um, anyway, so that information is there and people have to realize that it's theirs and and our our view is it's your information i got asked about these biometric laws i said it's great i think we need more of them i think we need to get like the europeans and really collect the information protect the information for the individual so you have the choice because i think that's what america is about it's having a choice and i don't think we have a choice today i mean that's my opinion and I, that goes against the grain for a lot of big companies that are making a lot of money off of us the, the juxtaposition to what I just said is a uh, credit card company that you all know that I can't name because of a non-disclosure agreement already does what you're doing, what I s suggested, because they know everything that's happening in every single uh, locality in every municipality, what you're buying, what the high level heuristics and characteristics of those are. And they sell dashboards to Dwayne Reed and Nike and everybody else that allows them to see at a very granular level what is happening in each district in the city. But that data is then sold to the city. So you pay for that data again in order for that data to be used for business improvement districts and so on and so forth. Well, that's insane. The, the data that you're already generating is going to a third party and then being resold to your municipality via your taxpayers' dollars in order to give the city insights to what you're doing, that is insane. Yet that happens every single day and three people put their hands up saying that they would give their credit card statements to the city. I actually think your examples highlight both of you know, the opinions I, I want to share, which is the, it's about, I see this about transparency and the value exchange. So I'm sure many of you use Gmail as your email client. And occasionally I'll hear someone say like, oh, they're reading my emails and serving up ads based on that. I, you know, they're stealing my privacy. And my response is often, are they serving you things you're interested in? Because if they are, what's the harm in that? Do you feel like they're using it for malicious behavior or not? And your original point around you were very transparent in the offer. Would you let the city pay your property taxes in exchange for your data? Knowing that ahead of time, I opted in because it's a very clear value prop. Your latter example around the credit card piece is, is I'm assuming they anonymize the data, but people don't know it. And I think that the transparency piece is, is critical here. Intellectually, humans often will say, oh yeah, I don't wanna share my data, I don't wanna share my data. But then in practice, people will step on a scale that tweets their weight, will have a credit card that automatically tweets or posts to social their transactions. So the actual human behavior often differs from the, the intellectual response. And I think, in my opinion, it boils down to transparency and then the value prop. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm like the ninth person in line here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely headed this way where, you know, we invest in a company uh, called Doc Authority that is you know, working on this GDPR regulation out of Europe where consumers have the right to be forgotten. 
and the fines levied on companies for not adhering to that are huge, up to 4% of global revenues for each incident, right? Wow. So if you're Barclays or Credit Suisse, that's, that's a big number. Um, so we're excited because the fines are going to start coming in May and the company's already growing really well. So hopefully that will really accelerate the business. But I think what it really comes to is, you know, and, I, and this will come to the U.S., I believe, also, is that we'll have the option to opt out. I don't think there's going to be a real opt-in thing. I come from the energy world. We did this green button thing that was a joke for a while where you could voluntarily upload your, you know, energy usage information to a portal. And it was, you know, complete crap. It's called, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't go there. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, actually where it's going is that we're all going to have to uh, basically create boundaries with our devices and with our data, just like we create for ourselves with each other, right? I, I know how I want to be treated and how I don't want to be treated, and I, I set those boundaries. And we'll probably have the ability uh, and also the uh, uh the responsibility to do that each on our own going forward. Let me put a twist on this for, for you, Bruce, because um, uh, IBM deals with a lot of uh, major uh, global multinational companies, and uh, each one has to deal with uh, you know, the, the, the requirements, the laws of the domiciles where data resides. And you know, you're working, you, you, you are working with um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of, of considerations that, that have to, you know, that come into play when you're dealing with, for instance, connected cities or connected agriculture. Um, could, you, could you talk about some of the, uh, maybe some of the unique differences when you're dealing with companies in different industries? You know, how they think about, how, how they think about data and privacy rules and as you're, you know, as a technology provider, right, you, your job is to make your customers successful, but you're also, you're also helping them navigate these considerations of who owns the data. How, you know, could, could you provide a bit of color around that, uh, around those considerations? Sure. Um, so one of the things I'd comment on, right, obviously from region to region, it varies quite differently, right? So if you're in Europe, and you're in a particular country, typically that personal data has to reside on a server that's in that country, right? So it, it, these laws are different depending on where you are. So that's one thing that I think you need to look at first and foremost before you go anywhere from there. Secondly, I think everybody wants to take um, privacy issues around data very seriously. It is very important, not just to my company, but to, to most companies that we deal with. I think, you know, when the audience was asked the question in the beginning, I think that sort of gave you the level of the boundaries, right? When somebody said about banking information, credit card or, or health, people like, yeah, I'm not so keen on that, right? And, and I would say that's a, a, an important delineation point, particularly in unaggregated data or data that hasn't been uh, autonomized. So I think, you know, if you look at somebody, you know, looking at healthcare information, probably the most sensitive if you're looking across all the US and you say, hey, you know, males in the US, you know, on average are gonna, you know, have X amount of blood pressure uh, at this age, I don't think anybody would be offended by that, even if their data is somehow in there, right? It's when it starts to get down to the personal level, we each don't want our personal data out there. Having said that, and this is a personal viewpoint, not a company viewpoint, I think the reality is, and I remind my family of this, that you know, the minute the internet was created, you're not a private person anymore. I mean, I hate to say that, but there's so much data out there on every one of us now that to go, oh, I want my privacy is a little bit naive, right? Now, I'm not suggesting, just to be clear, that we should just sit back and say, oh, you know, we accept all this. I think, again, in certain areas, it's very important that we have privacy. But I do think there is a certain amount of privacy you give up when you're out there doing things like purchasing on the internet or social media because as a point was brought up earlier i think there'll be people like oh i don't want to give out my credit card data that i just bought a new coach bag right at, at the local mall and meanwhile you're you're getting on facebook and twitter and you got the pan bag and telling everybody about it well that's public information right so i think you just have to look at it in context to what do you do and where is that information really coming from you may think it's coming from here it may be coming from someplace totally different Great. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to I'd like to flip things around to a bit more of a positive uh, uh, 
viewpoint now and, and just ask the, the panelists to talk about some, some areas where we, we start to see, we're collecting all this data uh, for the first time in history we, we can we can have visibility into business processes we can we can store the data we can apply analytics um, and this ha really has some potentially transformative impact and I would just open it up to anybody to talk about um, you know any any use cases that that make you more optimistic about the future and and you know where I mean data privacy concerns are, are, are certainly with us, but there's also the, the big promise. Sure, so I'll go first and maybe we'll, we'll head back down this way. But I think uh, one example, so last year, in conjunction with uh, Cooney, we did a hackathon in the spring. And the uh, Health Department of New York City provided data. Um, again, you know, it was all kind of blacked out data and there's no names or any of that kind of stuff. But they provided information on different people and different um, uh, diseases and things that they had. And, and the, the purpose of the hack was really to categorize that information using artificial intelligence and then ultimately take it one step further to figure out, well, how do we actually use that information once we have it? So an example could be the following. This ties back into the, the IoT thought. Um, back in the summertime, there was a whole issue with, in some places, uh, Legionnaire's disease. So imagine now that you have sensor information on top of buildings, right, water towers, you have drones looking, things of this nature that are gathering this information. That information can then be analyzed and correlated with this disease information that's being processed. So the fact of if we didn't have access through the New York Health Department to, to look at this information, that would be a big handicap because all of a sudden you could have this problem occurring where you're not even aware of it because you're like, oh, we can't look at the data. Now, again, the data is protected, to be clear, but I think that's a huge, huge benefit. You see the same thing in the flu season now, that, that cities are getting more on top of it ra rather quickly. The CDC's involved with that, analyzing the data as it comes in real time. That's the way you head these things off, right, in order to prevent further outbreaks or to figure out what the problem is. So I think there's a lot of actually encouraging things that tie these themes together, the IoT and, and the AI. I'm going to go way less exciting than that. that that's, that's pretty impactful. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in right now is we have this sort of weird divide still um, between how we interact and how we act as consumers and human beings versus what happens to us when we go to work, right? Like all of a sudden, this is why people, one of the reasons a lot of people, especially millennials, don't want to go work for a big company because all of a sudden you're thrown back to like 1985. Or you're stuck in this cube and, you know, you have a desktop and it's just weird. It's just unnatural. Um, so I like all these things that are making work life um, resemble our normal lives much more. Um, actually, my buddy Dave is here. We grew up together. We worked at O-Power together. He runs uh, sales for a company called Comfy out in the West Coast. And they're sort of like the nest for, you know, workplaces, right? I think about when I, thank God, I don't, really haven't had that many real jobs um, where I had to go into an office and do stuff. But, um, you know, when I was, you know, the thing that drove me nuts was I would freeze all day in the summertime. Like, I'm from Boston, but like, I, I don't like the cold. Doesn't mean I'm like predisposed to like cold. I'm freaking, I'm cold. Um, so I don't like that. You know, they basically give you the, the opportunity to change that, right? If I want a burst of heat in my spot and, you know, Aaron's a Eskimo and loves a cold, like we can have that, that discrepancy. So I like all these things that are just making work and life be a little bit more seamless than, than, it, than it is today in most places. Uh, as, a, as an example, I was going to go in the healthcare direction, so I'm going to, I'm going to respond without answering your question. But um, I mean, the, the theme to me is that the democratization of data, I think, is a really, we're at a really interesting and important part of society where people who have access to things that they didn't have access to, I think, is that they're able to make an impact against some of these issues that some are societal problems or some are more maybe capitalistic or, and some are both. I think that's maybe the biggest headline around the accessibility piece. And in that vein, to plug a, a company that, that we've worked with before, if you're looking for this data, uh, check out Enigma.com. And they have one of the largest uh, data sets of all public data available through a public API, including 
the New York data that, that you were mentioning before, Bruce, including a lot of the data that's that the White House and the, the um, federal government keeps that only releases to certain uh, providers. So if you're looking for big data sets, check out Enigma.com. No, no, no sponsored, no affiliation. I just think it's it's awesome. Yeah, I just uh, again, I want to step out of the United States for just a minute and, and talk about the rest of the world. You know, I look at I look at India and what they're doing with their Andhar system um, for, for biometric identification, where they've enrolled 1.1 billion people with iris and face. And they've done that because they want to hand out. And there's a lot of uh, uh, poor people in, in India, poor villages. They don't have any documentation. They want to hand out entitlements and they don't want to hand out entitlements twice. So they want to make sure they know who they're handing entitlements to. That sounds all great. Um, they want to have a cashless society. There's a, there's a lot of people that are unbanked there. They, they can't afford to bank or whatever, but they need to transact. And so they're trying to generate a cashless uh, system, things like that. So I, I see some real positive things like that. But they've just had some rulings in the Supreme Court that basically saying that your identity is you and your identity and, and the government can't necessarily take it and use it for their own purposes because they were selling some of the data for uh, advertising and you know those kinds of purposes. So so there's, there's, there's this, they're, they're kind of at the forefront of some of these things as a society, very large society, where they're really trying to solve some of these problems. There are some great advantages to, to having your own identity and, and yet being registered in a national database and things like that. There's some great advantages for, for developing countries. I look at Turkey. Where there's 2.8 million people living in tents on the border with Syria. And, and how do they, they, they're undocumented. They, how do they manage that as a country? Um, how do they manage food? How do they manage disease? How do they manage, you know, how to move these people on to, to other places? Um, so, so there's a lot of things that are going on now, uh, you know, that are all wrapped around identity that have some real positive effects. Um, but again, it's, it's how it's used. And I think, I think when it's used for certain purposes, it's not good. When it's used for other purposes, I think the guy mentioned that there's some really great applications. John, I'm going to put a little twist on the question since uh, I think a lot of people would be very interested in, you know, how uh, how working with you know municipalities and towns uh, is different, you know, from the standpoint of of uh, the, that the that the that the constituents are different and the, and the problems are are different. Um, you know, what, let's uh, I, could you talk sure. about kind of small wins and then sort of the big you know the big uh, existential challenges mm -hmm. sure. and, and compare and contrast those. I'll give another plus one to Enigma. Uh, they are a wonderful open data portal. And if you are thinking about uh, just getting data about stuff, they are a great place to get it. So I will also give a plus one to Enigma. Wonderful company. Um, so I was going to start with cities. I think there was three areas. But I think the, the most important thing to realize is the, the subtext of this whole thing is you're all valuable. You know, and I think that's a really important thing to realize. I think that's something that we forget a lot, uh, especially in the context of Facebook. Like, how much do you pay for Facebook every month? Right. Why? Because you're valuable, actually. Right. So you're all very valuable. And we forget that, that we are valuable. This whole thing is about us anyway, right? And so all of this data that we're talking about and all these abstractions, well, they're just us anyway. And so I like to think about that in the context of uh, cities. I think that we're in a lot of trouble with um, the income and knowledge disparity that we're not only in, in America right now, but also in the, in the world. We have a panel full of white men up here, which I think is uh, a yeah, huge problem. Um, and, and, and we're, we're you know, and I, and I, I don't know, that's, you know, we had someone drop out, so, but, but, but this is the world we live in, right? I mean, we, we live in this world where we're in the, although we love to have me on stage as a white man talk about how I'm on stage as a white man and rich people on stage at the Grammys talk about how they're on stage at the Grammys, uh, they're on the stage at the Grammys and I'm here, right? And so there is this continuation of knowledge and income inequality and there is a very direct um, correlation between data and sensors and efficiency and cities and the ability for us to lower income taxes, to make cities more. Um, I mean, when I speak to every single city planner, the number one thing that they say to me is the thing that I'm focused on, I don't care about your tech, I don't care about your silly Silicon Valley, I don't care about software. I went to school because I care about making cities equitable. 
right? I want them to be equitable. I want people to have a common level of access to the Maslow, and that's my, 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 my calling in life, right? And we've seen Uber and Lyft and everyone else, Airbnb, come into town and completely continue to the displacement of that, right? Rich tourists from other countries can continue to come to whatever communities, and that's great. But where we're actually <coughs> likely going to see the most uh, impact to the bottom line, I think, of society is in health and, and our, our, our built environment, right? Um, I think everyone's exactly spot on, right? That health is super, super important, that the Iowa, uh, Apple Watch can spot an, an, an arrhythmia, and that we're going to be able to do preventative health, and all that stuff is going to be really important. I like, I, even though I've heard a million people on, on the Apple keynote stand up and say, how many people like closing their rings on their iWatch? I love closing my rings on my iWatch. You know, I actually like that. And these are the things that are actually going to make us healthier. They're going to bring us closer together. They're going to close the social divides and the, and the income divides and the knowledge divides, right? Um, now, we actually have to live that in the real world. We have to stop the, master, or, uh, the, the credit card companies getting our data and moving into the cities and, and m kind of maybe moving to the more European model of thinking about our, our government serving us. But it certainly can't continue to do that with like the private sector coming in and like um, uh, bu building these huge uh, uh, wall gardens and 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 not all. It was nice to hear the IBM guy talk about you know open ecosystems and stuff like that. So I think that's really where we're gonna uh, see a lot of the actual bottom line impact. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh pivot this a bit because you hit on some really important points, which is essentially like what do, what is technology doing to us as a society, right? I mean, oh, this, God. This idea as, as well, I mean, this, well, uh, I was I mean, thinking uh, about, by quitting. the way, I just want to say we're, you know, we're open for questions, but you know, one of the concerns that I have, right, is that like we are, at, you know, as you, as we watch the generations become more and more connected, people become more isolated, right? Yeah. Teenagers yeah, are, yeah, yeah. you know, the incidence of depression yeah. is getting oh, higher. Yeah. People are getting, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, they're ugly ids come out online rather than you know we don't, learning how to deal with people you know face to face and and we're you know we there there is a um, magnification sure. of uh, the stratification of uh, income and cognitive differences as well as increasing tribalism in in many respects which is not good for all of us right because we kind of all want health is great tech is great I love tech but you know what? You kind of look at the tech utopians and say, guys, you know, there's a downside to this with um, uh, with technological unemployment. And when you apply this to to, to for instance, education, um, you know, there there certainly are some you know there's some green shoots. But you know, I, I'd be interested in in how uh, any of the panelists feel that we you know we can apply you know the tools that we have at hand, um, whether they be you know our human personalities or our technologies, you know, to kind of offset some of these negative trends okay. that are being brought by these disruptive technologies. Okay, I'll be real fast. Uh, so we could get real philosophical here and get into nature versus nurture and yada yada. yada. Uh, I am severely dyslexic. I can almost barely not read. And most certainly, I couldn't add anything. Uh, and the most amazing thing for me has been discovering both text to speech, which is fantastic, and being able to have words flashing in front of my face really, really quickly, Spritz or whatever, some dyslexic app that allows you to not focus on the whole thing, right? And so in that regard, technology has been amazing, right? I mean, there's all of these people. We, we, are all so uniquely different inside, but, but, but shades of gray on the outside, right? And so there's this want in society to think that we're so similar, yet inside we're so different, right? And that's sort of this weird nature versus nurture. And what, you, what we typically do in technology is look for a tech, look for technology solutions that solve the shade of gray across the whole spectrum, yeah. right? Now, mostly we make it for us. Don't tell anyone else, right? But, but 
but it we don't think about the whole dyslexics or women or people of color or whatever right like we don't focus on and i think that's the next sort of thing and it requires venture capital it requires founders it requires people to want to dominate niche markets right we have this disruption thing we need to get everyone we need to do the uber we need to do the lyft we need to do the apple we need to do the whatever no there are mom and pop shop startups to be built there's mom and pop technologies to be to be built and they can um, be applied to very many different demographics and that's actually the exciting thing about technology because that's the exciting thing about being a human there's very many different people I'd actually like to jump in and, and sort of be a little panelist myself and just say um, what one of the most the, the most profound things that ever impacted me was you know to see the impact that technology can have on people who have lost limbs so I met a guy at um, uh, the 2045 conference in uh, 2013. This guy, he was he'd been a sheet metal worker in the UK, and um, you know he had lost his his arm, and he was you know he had to wear one of these little claws because that was the only thing that he could he could have to replace having lost his hand. And he he said he was depressed. He was he when he walked he walked around. He felt like people looked weird at him, and and there was this. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I'll, the, the name will come to me, but there was essentially it was, a, it, was it was an arm that was bit, that had fingers that he could control, that had a strong grip that he would you know he plug in. It was it was beautifully fitted to him, and it just gave this guy a new lease on life. They brought him. It was the first time he'd ever been to New York. You know, he came to New York. He spoke. I swear, I was missy eyed when you could see that you know the three D printed technology, the prosthetics that were individual. They were, they were targeted to the individual. Um, so, you know, I gave him a little New York welcome. I said, you know what? Look, you have this prosthetic. Look what you can do. You can, you just take the middle finger like this and go, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you know, we had such a great laugh. It was, a, it was the most amazing experience. And, you know, and those are the types of things. I saw, actually saw a presentation this afternoon that that's why I wanted to share this of somebody else who's done some work. If you'd ever seen Todd Macover's uh, TED Talk, uh, where, where he's working with Dan Elsie, who was severely, uh, severely disabled. I think he had cerebral palsy, and what he did was he, he created a way for him, for this soul to create music and create art. You know, through you know he would be able to move his his his, his eyes for people who are disabled to be created to, to unlock that spirit, that human spirit within. That's the you know in a way that's the Promethean magic of technology. That if you know when we harness it, it does allow our individuals to come out. Right, but it's it is, but those those aren't mass market technologies, right? They're they're small technologies. They come in in, in certain areas, um, but when you see it, it can be so amazingly impactful. So I just had to share that. Sorry. Anybody else have any questions? You're certainly welcome to. But if if anybody, oh wow, okay. So jump ball. Uh, you guys feel strongly, or should we ask some questions? All right, you're you're you are first, and then you're next. Okay. Can we get the uh, we'll get the get the mic here? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, so it's along the ideas of identity. It's a maybe a true prong question. I'm sorry, but the idea of biometrics has been studied by a lot of people. But the whole notion of your biometric being your, your password is dangerous because you can change your real password, but you cannot change your iris. So if someone captures your biometrics and then that gets hacked, someone can recreate you. Caesar's cipher from 2,000 years ago, which is you can create a password and you can change it over time, I don't think is a bad thing. But if someone can capture your iris or your facial recognition and recreate that, you're kind of screwed. So that's number one. Number two on identity, um, I, you didn't talk about blockchain, although I think, although I don't believe in the blockchain as a panacea, a cure for all, I believe if some people have their control of the identity via blockchain or public-private key, there could be you know, a solution. So. Yeah, if you want to make a mask that looks like me to get into my iPhone, go for it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, there is plastic. No, no, I'm not saying making a mask. Let's say the iPhone. <laughs> in the beginning, when they had the fingerprint scan, people hacked the iPhone where they took the fingerprint and it can recreate the token. Yeah. I'm a programmer, I have a consulting firm, and they can send that same signal saying, this is who he th says he is. So you're kind of screwed. Uh, yeah. And people have done that already. No, I'm not saying the device. Okay. okay. iCloud or something okay. like this. Yeah. Or my email or my bank account. Right. I, like, I think the the fallacy of security is it's a fallacy, right? I mean, it's not real. 
So the, the greatest the security, the greatest security is the illusion of security. There is no security to your point. So if you want to get into my device, so you're saying point, we should not have biometrics, or should we should? Who gives a shit? Have my password, have biometrics. If you want to get into my device, you're going to get into my device. What if you're an investment banker? Okay, then get into Can my we device. Get the, uh, okay. uh, just two things. One, um, questions are just for everybody, 10 to 20 words long, and they end in a question mark. Okay, yeah. so that's questions. Uh, and then okay. as you guys are responding, make sure you actually pass the mic so that yeah. whoever is Please talking do. has it. Thank you. Along the lines of what John was saying. What's the alternative, right? We can go back in time. Like if somebody wants to, I think about this in the transactional side of things, right? If somebody hacks my Apple Pay transaction between my phone and, you know, the Dwayne Reed, you know, reader or the database it sits in, gee, like, good for them. Like the alternative is like I put money in my refrigerator or freezer again and somebody's going to come break in and steal it. Like it, there's always an alternative and it's been the same conversation along the way. Um, we understood, yeah. no, we understood your Why? This point is that they're Wait, not we, changeable. That, that past, changing, everything else has a changeable yeah. element yeah. to it that yeah. biometrics right. are. Right. Let's get to blockchain. So, so, yeah. That's not exactly accurate. Though. You can actually encode with different algorithms and things like that. You can change the biometric. It's just a digital representation. The actual, take them, take re the mic. Mic, mic. Yeah. Sorry. The, the actual recreation of, of your iris from a digital uh, template is, is impossible. So, so um, or, or, or the face, the problem with the face is it's everywhere. You're being recorded everywhere you go. Your face is everywhere. So there's no way to stop that. It, it's happening. So, um, so your, your, your iris is a lot harder, and, and so it's there, you know. So um, it, does, it does matter. It does, it's, it's the level of security. What's on the other end? How big is your bank account? Not very big. Okay, so it's not worth hacking, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to. High worth individuals, it may, it may matter, uh, but I don't think it matters in general. People don't, don't uh, you know, there's not, it's not going to be worth that much to, to actually hack it. And just a quick, quick follow-up on, on the, the role of blockchain. If around with identity? Yep. Sure. So just a couple yeah, thoughts on this topic. I'll address the, the blockchain side of it first. So I don't think, again, blockchain is going to be the complete panacea to that because like anything else, things can and will be hacked. The nice thing about blockchain, though, is things are auditable. So you can backtrack and figure out what happened. Yep. You know, the, the chain was broken, this is what occurred, blah, blah, blah. So at least it's a lot easier to do that audit capability, which is very important, right? Sometimes, I mean, we see this all the time now, people or entities get hacked and they either, they don't know about it for months or then sometimes there's companies that know about it and then don't report it and then we won't go there. But um, at any rate, so I think that certainly will help. But I think, you know, that whole area of sec security is just, it's ever evolving, right? And, and it's like somebody once told me, I lived in Miami for a while, right? And I had a car and I, you know, got this alarm system and I, I went to extremes, right? To make sure it wouldn't get stolen. At the end of the day, my neighbor goes, well, geez, I don't know why you did all that. If somebody really wants your car, they're going to get it. And I was like, you know, now that I think about it, they're right, right? Now that may, may not make it right, but that is the reality. So I think... It's if for some reason somebody figures out how to copy my eye, then we're going to have to come up with some different methodologies in terms of security. It's going to be ever evolving, but nothing's ever going to be perfect, right? If somebody, I think, does want to hack in somewhere and has enough time and money, they can probably <coughs> do it, right? Yeah. And a good example yeah. that somebody uh, came up with was lottery tickets, right? You can actually create a computer program to figure out, hey, these are the winning tickets I want to go submit. But then the amount of tickets you'd have to buy and all the math involved and all this, you'd end up spending like a fortune. It wouldn't be worth it. So there's time and money involved. And if you don't have both of them, you're probably not going to be able to do it. Great. Next okay, question. great. Thank you very much. Um, one common theme among all of you panelists, are, I presume, is technology. <clears throat> Some of you might be working on similar projects. Some of you might be working on totally different projects. But as you go to work every day or think about the things that you read and exposed to, what are you seeing that excites you most and why? The question is, what do you see or you, what you're working on that excites you most in terms of technology and the reason why? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just I'll say it very quickly. I won't spend a lot of time and I'll pass the mic. I'm not actually working on it yet. I'm just starting to get into it, but quantum computing. Uh, the reason why is I think it's really going to be the next sort of huge breakthrough that's really going to increase the horsepower of what we can do with computers. 
I would broadly just say anything in transportation. Um, you know, I'm fascinated. I was just in Dubai also seeing what they're doing in terms of leapfrogging um, the infrastructure there and see what China's done in that world. Um, we have a lot of hurdles in terms of existing old infrastructure needs to be replaced. So things like Hyperloop are, are really compelling. Um, being in New Jersey, where there's some telecom companies, we're close to a few, and the 5G opportunity, I think, is going to open up some very interesting new businesses. I also think it sort of ties into the previous example of the technologies that excite me the most are the ones that, that take the technology out of the equation, that make it a more human experience. And so when I come across things that are about the prosthetic limb or about the democratization of some, you know, of, of a data set or education, like those are the things that get me excited. But as we get away, I mean, Uber is super useful, but as we get away from like the wealthy white guy stuff and get into the more real world stuff, I think that those are the things as, as I see them that, that get more exciting. So I'm, I'm a little bit sick, and when I look at technology, I, I actually get a kick out of some of the technology and how it's, how it's really, really screwing up the, the, the system. <laughs> and, and how many people in the room use Venmo? Yep, every day. You're making bankers crazy. You're making them nuts. Keep using it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very annoying when the new banking system emerges and it's peer-to-peer. Yes. And it's not blockchain. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's interesting. Um, I think I, I, I'm excited. I think we've done a terrible job of applying technology to society. Um, and I think that that's becoming more and more apparent to more and more people, and I think that's exciting. Um, and I look forward to and I, I also hate it when people uh, not sexy uh, spaces having technology applied to them. Um, and I think that, I mean, I work in cities and I left a sexy technology company to, to do cities. Um, I make no money. This is not a good space. I highly do not recommend doing it. Um, but, but, but to transit and these things are the kind of the important things that we have to deal with. I think we're getting to the end of the ability to um, pretend that everything's okay. Um, and I'm also uh, excited, and, 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 and so the application of that, I think, it, the, the three most important applications of that are quantum computing, I think is really, really important. I think that it's gonna be a complete game, game changer. I think it, it is incomprehensible for most people to understand how absolutely paradigm shifting that's going to be um, mostly because the idea of putting an abacus next to a superhuman um, is just insane so artificial intelligence and neural networks put next to quantum computing so that abacus style uh, computation slash ability to abstract very very quickly based on real real datums and and then the application of all of that into our built world which is where I work, um, I think is, is really useful. So traffic, being able to, to fix a traffic system, to be able to uh, route an ambulance based on a, a nest smoke alarm going off, uh, to be able to uh, send a drone to a car accident in real time uh, based on an image recognition of that car accident, knowing that the likelihood of fatality is whatever percentage, um, to be able to take your way, millions of ways devices, which Google has through Alphabet and Intersection and their new product Flow, um, which will will allow everything basically in a city to work holistically through Waze and Android and all of these, these access to data that they have. Um, that's a whole new way of thinking about cities and the way that we work and stuff like that. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's no wonder that they're building new cities and that Bill Gates is doing stuff in Arizona and stuff like that. Hi, my name is Clayton Banks. I'm from Silicon Harlem. And <clears throat> I'm also a white man, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, but I do appreciate what you said. S certainly the young guy in the ineffable hoodie. Not sure what color that is, but it's cool. Salmon. Oh, uh, there you go. We're Salmon. building. Salmon. I hear you, and I, I love the Salmon, eating. Salmon, I'm eating it tonight. So we are building a smart city corridor in Upper Manhattan to do just what you talked about. What are the use cases? So I just want to bring it to New York and really local New York. So some of the couple of use cases that we're really focused on is waste management, for example. 
um, vermin, which is, affects all New York. Um, we're certainly looking at transportation. When you look at all of the things that are coming on, the things that are coming on the network, somebody mentioned 5G, and I don't want to be buzzword compliant. If we're going to talk about this, let's be really real about what it is. I'm curious, 45 tomorrow is going to be talking about broadband. He's going to talk about infrastructure. And I'm curious what you guys envision as what our future infrastructure needs to um, really have in order to support the billions of things that are going to be coming on that you have been discussing. You. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure why he's looking at me because I know shit well, about this topic. Well, well, the only reason I was saying is you have a little you have some familiarity with. It. I, I guess well, I have some familiarity. Let's talk connectivity. Just that, let's I'm, talk that I'm later. maybe underplaying it, but um, I, I, that's a great question. I can't say specifically what they should have, but I think what they've lacked in the past is scalability. And so every time these things need to be upgraded, the enormous amount of time and cost it takes to move these things forward, right? So. Um, I'm involved with the city of Hoboken and, and with Governor Murphy in the state of New Jersey. Something we are ignoring in the room when we talk about like the the, um, you know, the privileged issues here is connectivity is still a real issue, even in places like New, Jer New Jersey and my guess is in, in places like Harlem as well. So I think it's important that as infrastructure is built, my, my over the, the overarching uh, theme here is that I think it, is, it needs to be built by people who understand where technology is yeah. going because in a few years it will change again. It will have some new administration waste another decade of time you know, raising the capital to build la you know, yesterday's technology, which is what happens in a lot of these places. We call it engineering for equity, engineering for equality. You can use that next time. And also, um, it's really critical in our view anyway uh, that the community's voice is heard. So as much as we are designing technology and all that kind of thing, and some of it is really super and superb, uh, if it's not impacting, you're right. 40% of our homes in Upper Manhattan do not have broadband in the home. It's a cry and shame to go by and see kids doing their homework at Starbucks. So it's also a key word in this whole equation, which is affordability. We can dream all this stuff up, even with Watson, which I love, but it's got to be affordable and accessible to everyone if, if we really want this to work for everyone. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I agree on that, and I think one of the, the initiatives I know the, the mayor started a while back was uh, making Wi-Fi more publicly available, and I think that's really the answer. I mean, I hate to say that, but I mean, I, I've even seen that with my own daughter, right? It's like all of a sudden, it's, she used to be there with, with her Apple device and go, oh, you don't have Wi-Fi, right? And, and the minute she got Wi-Fi, she you know, was able to access books uh, through her school or whatever the, the case may be, and I think, that connectivity can't be uh, underestimated because without that, you're really at ground zero, right? So I think if the city should start to think ahead, how do they really address that problem, make it uh, uh, available? And then the, the other part of that is obviously within the home, the devices to complement that, right? So whether it's an iPad or, or it's uh, you know an iPhone. Now, the good news, I think nowadays, a lot of people do seem to have uh, smart devices, so, so I'm not sure that's as much of a problem anymore. But when you get to some of the other, you know, more expensive devices like an iPad or a laptop, they need to address that as well. Because once you have these things, then the world is your oyster. An example is I was doing uh, math with my daughter, who's in ninth grade, and she didn't think I was doing the problem right. And I said, "Well, wait a minute, watch this." So I get on Google and I and I typed in Google. I said, "Look, I want to do this." equation so it says enter in the equation and literally i hit the button and it graphs it for me and i had never used this app i just googled it and there it was and i graphed it and i said doesn't that look exactly like the graph i did on graph paper i do things old-fashioned right and she's like oh yeah that does look right and i'm like yeah all right what's the slope of this line and we went through the whole process so this is a very important point i think you're spot on and i think if you know that's an area the city needs to keep being hounded on to make sure that the stuff is in place can I make just one last comment? I'm done. Um, this is for the whole audience. So one of the things that we're doing a lot of research on with Columbia and NYU and Rutgers and a bunch of other universities is <clears throat> when you're looking at the IoT world and AI, one of the key issues is latency, right? How, if, if we all are talking about autonomous cars or driverless buses, especially in an area like New York, you don't want that signal to have any kind of delay, right? If you're gonna make a turn or go straight, it's just be accidents all over the place. Have any of you worked within the Cloud Edge space? What type of, I mean, maybe that's not your thing, but has anyone worked in that? Yeah, we, we, built, we, built, we built data 
say platforms are cities, really autonomous vehicles use it, it's okay. Don't exactly. worry. It's actually the latency doesn't matter that okay. much. It's it's okay because 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 in reality, turn by turn of the vehicle is uh, uh, the turn by turn of the vehicle has to be uncorded anyway. So it, it has to be, uh, and so and that will happen, and that's sort of a, se a separate conversation. Like I I I understand what you're saying, um, and and I think it's it's. Um, it's unrealistic to expect a neural network on a device to be able to understand what's happening in its local context, uh, also using uh, context that's garnered from an external source. So that is to say that the cars themselves should have to be able to operate without a, a network connection. Where we see cities being involved in that and the, and the latency component that you're talking about is things like 911 dispatch. So there, we've just dispatched a, uh, uh, an ambulance and so it's gonna be heading down this place, uh, down the street, that, that might be taken into account by a neural network and, and route the car. Um, but, but certainly millisecond latency and all that stuff there should be no network connection to the device any anyway in order for it to operate autonomously within the um, uh, context of the of the built world. Just just one quick thing on what you said because I think it's really really important. Actually, the the broadband thing is kind of bullshit. Um, access to broadband isn't that important. Uh, what you how you innovate and how you think about the world and what you decide to do, what you decide to, to create, uh, is not dependent on how you get it online. Yeah, like, okay, your internet's fast. Cool, you can download movies faster. That's got absolutely nothing to do with innovation, nothing to do with software innovation. I spoke before the Federal Reserve on this. They, they, I, I, yes, that 100% is what that report said, and I sat, before Ed Glazer, the uh, uh, chairman of the Kennedy School at Harvard last month, and he asked me, why is it that we put all this money into broadband internet and we don't have a Silicon Valley in every city in America? Well, people who build software don't care about how fast it gets on the internet. You know, like all you care about as an end user is how fast the internet is to access it. But to create innovation, has absolutely nothing to do with the speed of your internet. If you want access to the internet, we need community centers, libraries, people where we sit down next to each other and talk to each other and actually deal with things like humans, like you said. But this idea that we should be able to go into a room and have high speed internet, it's a fallacy. We have a question over here. Thanks. And by the way, I was I was going to say there's a really it's a it's a uh, an interesting implication that when you move from a centralized sort of cloud mobile paradigm to uh, you know where where you're trying to push analytics closer to the edge, that actually goes from sort of centralized to decentralized. So you know in the long arc of things, right, we're 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 just about to hit another very powerful paradigm shift, which is um, also has some. Uh, I didn't weigh in on the technologies or the the forces that I'm most excited. I'm I'm actually most excited about this concept of decentralization, but what that's going to require, it requires sort of refactoring and rethinking the way that applications are written and architected so that the you have the data and the analytics that are most relevant to, you know, the, that have the most relevance to, you know, being the closest to the edge or, or you're doing some historical analysis. So that's another, you know, 10 to 15 years of re-architecture of systems ahead of us. So it's, it's you, you kind of... I, I would love that. I would love that. Th thank you for the question. Um, another one over yes. here. Hi. I'm Carol Bonovich, and I'm starting a meetup called Democratize AI. And my question for the, pe it's the first me meeting is March 8th. And anyone can come bug me, give me their information, and I'll, of course, invite you. But my question to the panelists is, what is the most pressing ethical issue um, for each of you in regards to AI, IoT, big data, but for each of you, I'm sure there's one thing that is upsetting, maybe more. 
So give me one one thing that upsets you. Uh, well, I think when you're when you're dealing with AI, it's obviously you know how, uh, the the kind of data you feed in uh, can be very very disturbing. The outcome if you don't feed bias. in the if you don't, yes the bias is is extremely disturbing and and it's it's unanticipated. You, you, you have to really think through how you, what, what you put in and how that might come out. And, and you may have your own bias built in that you don't even know you're putting in. And that's what's disturbing to me. If my last name is more likely to be African American, I am more likely to be served adverts for bail bonds and stuff like that. That's insane. Right? My, just because I'm profiled in this way doesn't mean that I'm going to act this way. That's insane. Yet, if, if I am, my Google profile is more likely in that demographic, I am more likely to be served things that match that demographic. Well, please. Uh, my concern is probably less novel, but I think um, as, more, as more devices are constantly listening, what happens with that voice or the audio data there? Is something that's just been on my mind more and more. So it's, I don't have any any interesting things to say about it, but more and more connected devices are coming on. Then I think the, the the what happens to that data is a is an interesting issue. I somewhat agree. I would say that what scares me is that we're really lacking in some of the safeguards that we're so accustomed to in other parts of our lives. Right? We put our money into a bank account because we know it's insured by the FDIC. I you know. My Amex card gets hacked every six months. Amex calls me, tells me it was hacked and used to book a hotel in Europe. And I'm like, okay, send me a new one. Canceled, fees refunded, all that. The, when we live in that world today, the process of getting there was extremely painful. People lost a lot of money, right? Bad things happened, there was pain. I unfortunately think we're headed towards that in the financial world to some extent, uh, especially in crypto where there is no safeguard. If you get hacked and lose $400 million, it's up to the company to step up and pay you to, or not. I'm also worried in terms of our labor force. I do think we're on the next edge of a massive labor reduction in a lot of areas um, that will affect a lot of people that probably hasn't affected before. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, if history is any indication of, of the future, there's going to be a lot of labor pain, very high unemployment, uh, and really forcing some sort of correction to how we look at um, uh, wages and, and Social Security and, and all of our benefit system. Uh, so as far as the concerns I have, I guess it's, it's just uh, two of them. One is around AI that people don't view it properly. It, it really should be used uh, to <laughs> augment what we do as human beings, uh, like all other computer technology, right? I, I run a, today a, currently a BI program. I want to analyze, let's say, my sales. I look at the numbers, and then I make decisions based on that. I don't let the computer decide what I'm going to do in my business, right? I run the business. It's just like we sort of joke in, in work, right? It's the accountants and lawyers don't run the business. The business leaders run the business. So it, it's, you know, knowing who runs the asylum and, and Keeping that in line, I think, is, is important. And then the only other you know, comment I would make is around um, data. I think that uh, because so much information is being processed now and so much data is collected, that's goodness because, as I described earlier in the health example, you can help diagnose different things and figure things out. The downside to this is if somehow that data were artificially corrupted, and I'll leave it at that, but you can figure out the ramifications of that. Great, uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. Yeah, <clears throat> hi, I'm Robert Politzer. I'm a co-founder of the Green Street Network. I'll just give a little quick plug for us that we're, uh, um, <clears throat> we're hosting a uh, Clean Tech Age Expo and Conference at the New York Hall of Science, April 16th and 17th, and uh, might be reaching out to some of you folks to participate, but, um, uh, to the point of, the, of uh, this panel tonight, um, and this may or may not be appropriate, but you're talking about security, and it just really hit me like a ton of bricks that our, you know, a huge security issue now is with our elections. And I'm wondering if, if all the security that we're talking about, how, how you would advise uh, state, local, federal governments on securing our elections on, and improving our election systems. 
Canada where you pick either a beaver pelt for one person or an igloo for dip the your, other Dip person. your finger in purple ink. I, you know, actually, it's an, I, I don't want to go too far off, off course because it's an amazing question, but, um, or it's, it's a big issue for, for public, uh, public elections. But actually, if you think about the, one of the, the potentials for uh, de, you know, decentralized organizations is that you can, have, you can incorporate voting, uh, fr you know, blockchain-based voting with your, with your ID and say, okay, you know, listen, I have a view on this certain issue and if something comes up, you know, to be able to have kind of iterative voting, um, you, you know, this is, this is still in the dreamy stage right now, but, but potentially some of these decentralized tech, you know, consensus-based technologies, I don't want to use the blockchain word, um, do offer an opportunity to create economic systems. For instance, unlike Google and Facebook, which extract all their value from everybody's input, um, you think about, uh, you know, musicians and journalists who have, you know, whose content essentially, because it's digitally re rep replicable, you can each copy is, is, doesn't degrade. Um, when you make a digital copy, or if, if you were to be able to tag that with rights and be able to have a much, a much more fair, equitable distribution. I mean, this is, you know, this is a bit of utopianism that's, that's emerging out of, you know, out of decentralization, but it does tie back to governance, right? And we'll see as, as, as countries are, uh, uh, my friend David Orban runs the Network Society, and I would actually highly recommend if you want to go check out some of his talks, or um, he's, because he's actually, he's working on a couple of projects, including Pangea, which is an idea of a completely decentralized governance system that could be applied to towns, to, uh, to municipalities, or, or, or states, or even small countries. And when we do have something collapse, whether it be Venezuela, Zimbabwe, or some other failed state, something comes in and you, we have the opportunity to build from the bottom up, you know, that, you know, there, there are, you know, there are people thinking about these things. I don't know, you know, what it'll, what it'll turn into, but I, that was just my three cents there. <laughs> I only have one comment. What was wrong with paper? I can only talk to what's happening in Chicago. What's happening in Chicago is that they are implementing a blockchain style system, which will be your city identity card and will get you access to the library and the bus and city hall and everything else. And the idea behind that is if you have withdrawn 32 library books over the last four years and ridden the bus 17 times and yada yada, you are probably allowed to vote in that state. We have a question back there. Don't touch it. <laughs> oh, uh, do, do you guys have anybody other comments? Or the next? Hi, I'm Jim Williams, Cisco Enterprises. Um, this is a conversation I had with somebody we were driving home from Vermont last two weeks ago. So we're talking about the Internet of Things and autonomous vehicles and their in, their ability to interact with each other on the roadways. Um, how? What do you tell the guy who's got the vintage bubble Porsche? Um, how he's going to interact with all those autonomous vehicles? Speed up. <laughs> he probably won't be allowed to drive it on the road, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with being allowed to keep it on the road because how many fatalities are caused by humans? Although 20, if you, once you have 20% of the cars that are autonomous, I mean, the, the research has shown that that, that reduces the, the fatalities decline uh, significantly. So if you're actually driving around, first of all, these autonomous cars obey all the laws. So, you know, if you want to cut somebody off and you know they're, <laughs> it's an autonomous car, you know, they're not going to chase you down and, and, and create a problem. So, in a sense, you know, that, that actually is, it makes the environment safer for the drivers that want to be reckless. So you can, I mean, it, what's going to happen is you've got 17-year-old kids behind a car that are cutting off, self, you know, autonomous cars and, and trying to really play chicken with them. Right. But will, will the system be able to anticipate that? It manual driver and then incorporate that into it yeah it should learn well that goes back to the questions of latency right and and how much you know how much intelligence do you have at the edge right so um, there are you know you have 
uh, the knowledge of the maps of the, that, that reside on the cars themselves. And then you have, for instance, these LiDAR systems are getting just so much, so much more powerful. I don't know if you're familiar with Quantergy's LiDAR system. So Quantergy, you know, it's, it's amazing. This is what I love about exponential technologies. It went from like, um, you know, $80,000 $80, for, for a LiDAR system, you know, six years ago for the first generation of, of uh, Cisco, of, uh, of, sorry, of the, of the Google self-driving car. And now with the Quantergy has these LiDAR systems that are the size of cigarette packs, you know, two of them for like under 300 bucks. You know, and, and it gets like 270 degrees. And if you see the the um, uh, the the resolution is like five uh, five centimeters rev resolution to like you know 100 meters. It's pretty unbelievable in in ice and snow too. Can I just add one thing? I, I think we get so caught up in all the technology talk here that it, I worked in the regulated world way too long to, maybe I'm jaded or grumpy or something. Like it's gonna take a long time for these two things to happen of like mass adoption of autonomous vehicles that works in the US and telling people they can't drive their cars anymore. They're, they're bubble Porsche, right? Like nobody's coming and ripping cars away from people. The, by the time that's totally phased out, like, you know, this side, adopts to the point where it's a tipping point and you know people are are still trying to drive their manual cars the problem with anybody left that's ever driven a manual car before like kids will grow up and just expect to hop in and be driven around somewhere automatically so i don't think this is really gonna be a problem besides you know some relic yeah your, your key point to watch out for when jay leno starts selling off his cars then you know you're in trouble Any other questions? I've got a question for the panel. Um, so we haven't talked about smart homes, but you know, when, when we're thinking about uh, you know, what, what makes sense to you to be connected, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of these. Smart home was, was, was really hot a couple of years ago at CES. I mean, you would have the connected dishwasher and the, you know, the connected toilets and you know, connected refrigerators. But you know, there's some things that, what makes sense to you, what doesn't, and what do you worry about? So just very quickly, I think the smart home aspect, I think, is real, real important and could have a, a big, huge benefit for the elderly. I think that's the real sweet spot, at least initially. And then over time, you know, one can decide whether or not they want their fridge realizing they're out of Diet Coke, placing the order, you know, through Alexa, getting it delivered, you know, uh, from Amazon or Whole Foods now, I guess, if you do the extrapolation backwards, dropped on your front doorstep by a drone, maybe that's too much for me, right? Maybe I want the drone flying inside and actually putting it in my fridge, I'm getting lazy. So we'll see where that all goes, but I really do think the elderly is, is where I think it could be have an initial impact. Um, I'm a big fan of the things that are, that are kind of current, which are some of the things that, that leverage energy efficiencies. And actually, I, I'm concerned about the applications for the elderly, especially in reading about how their biggest concern is the, the loneliness factor. So that if we start connecting all their homes to see that they're healthy or need some drink in their fridge from Amazon, they're losing the human interaction of someone coming to their home and checking on their health and delivering their hint water, for instance. So. I think it's something to be very careful about, the, the human implication of, while it might be more efficient and, and easier, are we like losing humanity in the process and just it's a bunch of boxes of elderly people whose shit just shows up regularly and they never talk to anybody? Yeah, let, me, let me just comment. Yeah, so I, I think there's a balance there, right? It's like everything in moderation. I'm not suggesting that you know, the kids don't visit their elderly parents or that other people don't come. Having said that, I will tell you, having, you know, d dealing with an elderly parent that human interaction, if I want to have a nurse there seven by 24 and call for my mom, that's a lot of money. I mean, if you're not in that situation. So there is a balance there where some automation can come into play that provides a level of safety. And quite frankly, we have this today, right? A lot of elderly people have like a panic button. I fell, I, you know, I hit the button, somebody comes to get me. That's really what I was referring to, not we're sticking somebody in, in a hamster cage and nobody visits them. I'm not really oh, sure where to go. Over here? Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask you. Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you. My, my question is actually related to that loneliness or human factor. Um, I, um, uh, I, I, you know, with like, you know, the Google Assistant and Alexa and Siri and all these AI assistants, um, there's a, m a move towards uh, 
kind of um, making these um, disembodied voices more human or more relatable. Uh, there's there are a lot of stories about how you know like the future of human um, employment is. Uh, is 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 those kind of like emotional labor, those you know human labor things that that can't be re reproduced. But I wonder if we're missing an opportunity to actually uh, have. Uh, I, I guess that my my question would be like, what, 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 is there an opportunity to kind of uh, have AIs do emotional labor for humans? <laughs> Maybe they're better at it than we are. I don't I don't know. I'm not sure we have it all figured out. Uh, <laughs> what? The uncanny valley, how humans distrust machines. <laughs> well, I mean, like, yes, yeah, so like, I, so I, I'm not sure, so like, for example, um, I'm pretty sure there is, this exists. No, but there is a, there is a psychologist. There's also bot based psychologists, and yeah. I don't know the stats well enough, but they're definitely much more effective than not talking to a psychologist. And I don't know the stats, I don't have to know how they are about talking to a human, but they're definitely very effective if you're interested in I'm not an expert in it, but there's a lot on this topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, I, if, if, if you've seen her, it's funny, a friend of mine has predicted that by 2025, something like 15% of Americans are gonna call a digital assistant their best friend. I'm like super worried about this. I have a seven and a four year old and we are very conscious about making sure that they know Alexa is not a person and like we don't let them on devices in general. I find tech people are actually less uh, put their kids in, you know, use less technology, which I think is noteworthy. Yeah. But I'm really concerned about the like two generations from now. Just people start talking in the air to shit waiting for things to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking there's some like back room of wizards. Like, you know, my daughter just starts talking and a box shows up a day later. It's kind of weird. It yeah. used to be those were the people that, you know, on the subway that nobody would ever bother. You know, they're sort of talking. To themselves <laughs> yeah. or, just yeah. yell into the, into the air. So I, I, and I think there's like that human implication of making sure, you know, I didn't grow up in a time where in, in high school we had smartphones. Like yeah. bullying is a major issue because of the 24-7 no. nature of socialization with, you know, in that way. So I think those kinds of things have a major implication that we're sort of ignoring. But yeah, as a as a father, I think there's a real dilemma there. Well, it's, I, it's for anybody who's a parent. I mean, we're you got to be concerned about this. The, you know, a new generation that's that's being uh, sh you know whose consciousness is shaped. I mean, the zeitgeist is completely shaped by you know how you relate to to your your friends and and how you use social um, <clears throat> interactions as you know essentially as a measure of your self worth. And you know, we it always used to be that way in high school, right? The, there was the cool kids and the uncool kids, and now a lot of these factors are magnified through the uh, the know, notifications the, on your phone. How many right, you know numbers right. are there above that yeah, F? Right. I mean, and 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 you know, if you if you ever read the book Salt Sugar Fact by um, uh, I believe it's like Walter Moss. I mean, it's like the the people who write these applications who. Who, who make the food that we eat, you know, they know there are certain limbic uh, responses to in, in our brains to the to games. Like we, you know, we're like, we're the little hamsters. We want those pellets for, you know, to, to uh, stimulate the endorphins in our brains. Instagram was delaying notifications so that they could tease them out over time to mm -hmm. trigger the dopamine reactions you're talking about yeah. so that they could literally hook their users. Yeah, it's, um, well, there's a couple of great South Park episodes on that, by the way. <laughs> I, uh, I, I used to, uh, I deleted my Twitter. I had a, a, a bunch of Twitter followers. Someone once told me my net worth de de uh, declined from deleting Twitter. Um, How and much? a lot. And, and like, like tens of thousands, well, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. And, um, and, but I would find myself sitting around thinking about witty, cool, interesting things not to say to them, to get me lots of retweets and replies. And then I realized of all that time that I, yeah, that I thought spending thinking about things, which is thinking time, I could spend not thinking about that and thinking about actually useful things, right? And I actually genuinely, genuinely found my life completely changed when I deleted all my social media because it was like, holy shit, I have all this thinking time where I don't have to care about my audience anymore. <laughs> You guys are the coolest panel, I swear. <laughs> this was so cool. We have um, wine, cheese, and crackers in a little fireside. If you go out here and take a left and you want a 30-minute deep delve into 
more about what we've been talking about and you don't want to be video videoed or anything, you can go there and enjoy for the next 30 minutes. Otherwise, thank you so much. Great audience. Thank you. Thank you.